What a pleasure and privilege to be here, hearing so many incredible talks today. Um, this little section is about lighting impact. And I'm going to just give a little bit of background and then hand over to my amazing colleagues, Anna and, um, and Zoni, to continue. So let's talk about lighting impact. I've really been struck by how many of us here have personal experience of young people with autism or special needs or ADHD. How many of you guys, certainly me, any, anybody else got kids around them? Yeah. Um, and you probably know just how much, how sensitive they are to light. In fact, is that the right? How do I do the next one? There we are. What we know is 54% of kids with autism struggle with visual discomfort in the classroom, and that has been directly linked to problems with concentration, behaviour. It sort of makes sense. If you can't see what's going on, you're going to get, move into a kind of fight or flight or anxiety mode. So we know that if the lighting's properly designed, we can already sort out a bunch of that. But we may also know that those young people really struggle with mood. Um, certainly my nieces and godchildren really suffer during the winter. And during COVID, we found a massive increase in mood um, issues. And those with learning difficulties struggle much more with mood, particularly during the winter, than so-called neurotypical kids. What's interesting is that we know that the right light at the right time, lighting at the levels that you might get in a modern office, is sufficient to reduce the risk of depression and the severity of depression, particularly seasonal affective disorder. We also know that kids with special needs really struggle with sleep. Certainly, my nieces and godchildren do. Um, and students with special educational needs really struggle more than the average with getting a good night's sleep. And we all know how hard it is to self-regulate, even as grown-ups, if you haven't had a proper night's sleep. Interestingly, lighting can support better quality sleep too. We see if we deliver enough light in the morning, we see the kids falling asleep earlier that day. We see them waking up earlier the next morning. That falls into a positive cycle into the next day. If they spend their days in the 300 lux um, that is recommended in a classroom and then go home and spend the evening on the computer, they live in a kind of twilight zone and their body clocks start to free run with disastrous consequences. And what's interesting is that these are critical stages for the wiring of their brain. So a lack of sleep has been directly connected with increased risk-taking behaviour, increased vulnerability to online abuse, financial... Um, alcohol, all kinds, just, it's, it's a real issue if they don't rewire from that toddler brain, that impulsive, I want it now, to a self-regulating um, frontal cortex, um, frontal lobe management. We also know that variable light, so light which shifts over the course of the day, can support students to manage their behaviours, including fidgetiness. It's, we see some really substantial responses to light. And when we give teachers lighting as part of the classroom, part of the tools that they, they, can, offer, that they can use, um, we see some extraordinary results. And in fact, another study, which I'm not going to show here, showed how teachers in lighting conditions, which were improved compared to the bog standard, um, had reduced migraines. A guy who'd been, had migraines every year for 10 years found he didn't take a day off for the first time. And perhaps some of you guys experience migraines, um, and you will know just how important light is to manage that. And now we know so much, not only about the visual cortex, the visual processing, but also about non-visual processing, so sleep, mood, um, behaviours. Um, EN12464, which is the office standard, it's, it's got all those things in it. it if you're going to move into a modern office, you're going to need to integrate proper lighting for health and well-being as an occupational health proposition. Lead, Briam, Well, Fitwell, they all integrate circadian lighting, they all integrate visual comfort for diversity. And yet, so, uh, I've been lucky enough to be in a chems process talking to head teachers and saying, yeah, 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 and then we get to the end and they go, now is it a hoist or some carpets? And, and overwhelmed, I mean, it was just fascinating to hear their teachers earlier. How on earth can they navigate that in six weeks? Who, who, I mean, 
Honestly, how, da how dare we ask them to make those big, important decisions? And the lighting <coughs> that you installed today will be there for the next 15 years, or at least it should be, if not longer. So they say, well, what's the limit? And you look at Lighting Guide 5, written in 2011. Mm. How on earth do you navigate that? And so perhaps it's not surprising that, Andrew, could you just... Uh, we end up with uniform, cool lighting like this, with little or no control, so it's either on or it's off, or you might be able to get one or the other, and the classrooms we've been looking at, um, you cl flick them on, and the teacher's hammering away at the button, and it's going on and off, and, and it's not designed relative... <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> and, and it's not designed relative to the, um, to the board, so we've got the board and the, and the lights are turned off this way or this way, and then the teacher's standing there trying to teach a class, and can you see what I'm saying? Honestly. So the, even some of the basics that we expect, like the ability to... Can you see the difference in atmosphere between that wall and that wall? You can shift from a, 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 a focus to a relaxed setting simply by changing the colour. We've all got Philips Hue in our houses. We all know what that looks like, and yet schools have nothing of that. All the schools I've seen, however gorgeous they are today, have all had a gridded ceiling with <coughs> minimum light levels on the desk, Honestly, how, now we know what we know, how is it possible still to do that? Anyway, I came here exactly one year ago and said, hmm, and I had been talking to teachers. He said, look, we just get to the end of this process. Just give me something legal. Um, just, you know, it'll be fine. It's legal, surely. So I came here last year and met Claire and Zani, and we went, hmm, the kids, so we, we, we're working with some teachers who are really excited by doing things differently, <coughs> Should we have a go? And said, yeah, let's. So most schools look a bit like this. They're, I mean, most of the schools we're ever going to have are already built. It needs to be flexible so that it can cope with all the differences in cohorts that we've been hearing about today. We need to retrofit. I mean, yeah, gorgeous new buildings, big windows, da 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 Honestly, most of them have got those gridded ceilings. We need to work with that. There's no point in imagining something different, <coughs> particularly as the schools need to continue to work. We can't stop them working for a whole term and faff about with the ceilings. It needs to be affordable. They've got no money, or they've got money for things that they believe are important, but we need to make sure that um, they understand the value, but also we're not asking them to chip in to stuff that they will never, ever be able to afford. It needs to be sustainable, and um, I was fascinated by the comments earlier about um, buying one sofa once well, um, but that's very often a very hard argument to make. Um, but sustainability is, is key, and we know that if you get the lighting right, it uses less energy, it lasts longer, um, and it needs to be practical. So the t most schools that I've worked with, um, there's a, a maintenance person, or I, I'm a trained electrician, so I spent time going around on t pat testing on site, and they haven't got any... Most schools you'll go to have got a few light bulbs blown because, you know, the person who's going to sort it out is doing something else for now. They're fixing the swimming pool or there's a bollard blown in the, in the car park. You know, these people are busy. We can't have something that's a faff. So we teamed up together and I rustled some really cheap, affordable, <coughs> retrofitty things that we could do. So first we had a, had a chat to the teachers. What, what do you know about light? What, do you know how it works? They like, hmm. Then we did some simple retrofit options. So looking at daylight, daylight control. Um, instead of just having the blinds down or up, is there, are there some middle ways? What about coloured gels? That's fun. They've got day of the week, and they started to plaster that all over the windows. What about just tracing paper? And then what about ambient and functional light? So we did some dim to warm. I mean, so the two different types of light. Um, and reading lamps, which actually weren't so successful. Um, and decorative and interactive lights, so strip lights, you know, just basic stuff off Amazon, which I was told off for, actually. Sorry, Amazon. Um, but, I mean, because they're, because they're not built to last. I mean, they're not commercially built things to last forever. But we just wanted to see whether there was any interest in whether it would work. Interesting findings. So we were lucky enough to team up with a, an amazing young MSc student from, um, from UCL. And she went around with her light meter. What was interesting was we saw that... Think things that were compliant didn't necessarily mean that they worked. So compliance is simply not enough. And the things they were looking for were artificial light control, which they have none of. They were looking for the quality of artificial light. Again, they've got 4,000 Kelvin um, ceiling panels with miserable color rendering um, and with miserable um, 
distribution, particularly around things like the teaching wall. Okay, that was time. Okay, so, okay, are we doing okay? Thank you. I've got my, you're supposed to cough when I'm talking to you. <laughs> so I'm not, no, 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 I'm confused. No, I'm confused. So what was interesting was that the teachers, what was interesting with this lady, she said, now I realize how little I know. But what was interesting was that we were able to shift awareness of light. But actually, I'm just going to go through what was really incredible, because we had no idea, honestly. These people are busy. They haven't heard of this stuff before. They don't know the name from Adam. And yet, we found with these two amazing head teachers and their teams, they went, wow, this is great. So we found that putting the window film on allowed kids to get the daylight well, you know, get, get the light and the modulation of light and the mood-enhancing effects of daylight um, while still self-regulating, just taking the edge off. And they loved the different colours because they have days of the week, so they were just playing with that. Um, oops. Colour-tunable panel. They said that made a substantial... And this is the kind of thing that you would see in any bog-standard office. Substantial difference to working conditions simply by having a panel which allows you to do what you saw just now. Um, helps them to regulate. So what they found was that they were shifting from focus to warm, and particularly around transition times, around meal times or around time to go home. RGB strip. They had a brawl with an RGB strip. They, it was all over the place. I mean, they, they put it around the, um, around the notice boards, and it's along the corridors, and, and they're saying, yeah, it's a destination now, this corridor. So they're changing the colours. And the other thing they were using was as a teaching tool, they're saying they're giving the kids control to say, what happens when you do this? Let's look at some causal effects. Fairy lights, oh. I mean, I saw some pictures of fairy lights earlier. So kids were sort of making dens with them. They were doing, there was so, the, the, uh, one of the head teachers, Diane, has actually got some in her staff room now. I mean, it's just, who knew that fairy lights could transform a space? Simply by thinking about bringing some joy into these situations. Um, Interactive tiles it worked very well in one school. Uh, they thought it was brilliant. They kept on using it. It was a kind of a reward, um, a way to think about taking turns. Just they started to use it as a real teaching tool. It was really fascinating. The other school, um, Diane School, was less good. So it was a bit gadgety. It was a bit of a bit of a faff to set up. So it just shows that every school has its own culture, and there's no one size fits all. You're not gonna we're not gonna put that in the output spec. You know, must have hexagonal <laughs> tiles, but must have something interactive playful, interesting. And the star of the show was this <laughs> little interactive chick toy, um, which you've, you squeeze and it changes colour. And for kids who were struggling to regulate or, or were nonverbal, the teachers would say, what colour, how are you feeling? And they would just kind of <laughs> until it went through to the colour that they were feeling. And at the end of the session, they might change the colour. And it was just amazing to see how they were able to use these bits of light so ambient, you know, basic structural pieces and then some more playful pieces to shift the way they were behaving in the space. So now I'm going to hand over to Anna to talk a little bit. So what we've done now is to take those findings um, and develop some, some um, solutions for a classroom and a transitional zone to see what happens when we actually create a retrofit solution. So we're going to talk through those. Yeah, great. Which one am I? Oh, no, I think sorry, it's that sorry. one. Great. I think, I think it's next, isn't it? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm Anna, and I'm from Haverstock. We've seen a couple of our schools today. Um, James spoke really lovely about Kentish Town, and uh, we saw Marjorie McClure with Rebecca uh, just now. This is the Hawthorne School. So it's a 72-place school for children with autism. It's in Essex, Chelmsford, Essex. It's got a um, residential setting um, for a smaller number of students. And this is due to be built, uh, finished, uh, in 12 months' time. Um, in the interim, they're in a temporary accommodation for less number. There's um, uh, 25 students at the moment. They're split between what uh, was a, a block for their trust building, so an office block, which was previous to that, an edu educational building. And then they've got these portable cabins that have been placed in an old tennis court. Um, so this is our test bed. <laughs> it might not be that inspiring compared to the last image, but um, what I think this shows is that if we can do work here in these spaces we can do it anywhere we don't need new spaces like like Shelley was saying this this could be a real game changer for for everyone um, and, and that makes it exciting for us um, 
just so you know, the, the classroom spaces are in these portable cabins, and then they have some classroom spaces in the uh, 1950s, 60s block, but they also have transition spaces and breakout spaces. They've got a lot of challenges that are very familiar to us all. Um, and we're working with Diane, as, as Shelley mentioned. She's our head teacher. She's very enthusiastic um, about what we're proposing here. Um, go on to the next. So the profile of the child at the Hawthorns right now, at, at the moment, they, they have ages 7 to 11. The main school will go up to ages 16. There's five or six children in each classroom. At the moment, there's five children in the study classroom that we're doing. Um, Diane has... Um, given me a very, I, I need to stick to the script on this one. Um, she said that uh, there are children with autism who have specific and high levels of need around communication, sensory processing, sharing spaces with others, self-regulation and learning. So what we want to see is how can the child uh, use light to better improve kind of these, these levels of need. Uh, this is a workshop that we did with uh, some of the children from her school where we made, well, we were supposed to make schools, but... They, they took the workshop into their own hands, as, as they often do. Um, we made some train stations instead. Um, this, is the <laughs> this is the classroom layout. So again, very familiar. We've got nine grid lights. Um, we've got a group room um, to the side, which uh, we talked to so many teachers about group rooms. What does group room mean? Group mean it's always individual room, really, or a regroup room. Um, and that's how they commonly use those rooms. And then in the main space, they have just a teaching wall and then teach and chairs. We've seen a lot of those layouts today. Um, when we were doing this study, we looked at, um, I think actually, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit. I know Zana's going to cover a lot about the transition spaces, but we have corridors with no natural light. Because this is a temporary building, they've got a dining room with no natural light also, uh, which is an ideal, but I know Zana's going to talk about um, how we're going to deal with those spaces. Um, Looking at what Shelley was talking about, these kind of phase one key findings, we kind of drew three headlines. So one was about teacher empowerment. Yes, teach the teachers. Um, so, and we're giving them control of the spaces so that they have more than just on or off. We're talking about flexibility of space. So provide, and the next slide will show this, where the classroom needs to perform for lots of different types of need, which will change year on year on year, or day on day, an hour on hour, for each of the children, because you could have five children with very different types of needs within one classroom. And then children's control. So giving a child control over a light, so that squeezy pear chick toy, uh, is one option, but also about choice within a room. So a lot of the, class, a lot of the schools that exist right now and are going to exist have limited space. They don't always have the sensory rooms that you need. The group room is already taken up. We've already talked about that today. The group room is gone because one child needs it, so you don't have that space. What are you giving within the main classroom for children to have that choice about where they go and what they want to spend their time doing during the day? So we had to think, and this is the classroom layout with the group room in this orange. Um, when we got the room, you could see the images, but what we tried to think about was, okay, choice. Let's think of how this room can be split up. We've got the uh, purple, so that's the teaching wall. Everybody sits around the teaching wall. We've got the red, where everybody can do group work together. Um, informal reading area, so we've put that beside the, the windows. We can do those window treatments, and I'll, and I'll get onto those. We've got a quiet corner, so because of the group room and the, the kind of geometry of this space. We could have a quiet corner where it could be a, a decompressive space. We've got a corral, a kitchenette, which we would hope you would get in all classrooms, and then the group room, um, which again, regroup room, individual room, however it's going to be used. Um, so I'm going to go into a couple of these different spaces and then show you the kinds of lights that we're going to put into these rooms as part of our next phase of study. Um, so this is the quiet room. Uh, again, they, they told us at the start, never underestimate the power of a fairy light. So we haven't. <laughs> um, so this group room, we're, we're thinking about dropping the ceiling, making it a much lower, cozier space, soft furnishings. Uh, twinkly lights, also using lights that have movement in them. In them. Uh, they don't have to be very expensive, and they can be things that you can move around. If a child is really enjoying them, you could bring them into the group room or, or bring them elsewhere. And then our... our mascot, the, the chick pair, <laughs> um, 
And then within the group room, we're getting different types of feedback, depending on different ages and the different teachers that are teaching there. So yes, you might use that group room for individual study, um, or you could use it as an additional sensory space. Wouldn't that be wonderful if you could transform a very bland, you know, dark room and small room into a semi-sensory room for the children who need it, and you could take those elements in and out year on year, term on term. Um, we've talked a lot about that kind of flexibility of space today, um, and it seems like this artificial lighting could provide a very real solution for us to achieve that. Uh, next was kind of the main learning tables and the teaching wall. So um, what Shelley was talking about earlier, about adjusting the color tone um, in these spaces so that it, uh, we started at the start of the day and it can go all through the circadian rhythm trying to optimize uh, children's learning and, and, and uh, make sure that they're focused on their tasks um, and not stressed. <laughs> um, but also integrating color. So how can we bring more um, grid lights in. It's not that you're using all of those lights because actually the teachers wouldn't want that anyway. It's too bright and it's too overloading. But you're just getting more focused light on each of the tasks um, as the teacher moves through their kind of day. And then within the corral space, so given, giving that student control of their light. So you'd have a focused light that would be focused on the, on the uh, desk at hand. And I know uh, Zana will talk a little bit more about how the teacher's approach has changed uh, between schools and that there is scope to have that flexibility. And then this is the informal reading area. So um, in consultation with our, our lighting designer, we looked at these colored boxes, which are incredibly robust. That's another thing that I haven't mentioned today, but it's been a real forefront of our consideration is how do we get something that isn't an Amazon fairy light. <laughs> Sorry, Shelley. Um, but you know, that, it, that is super robust, that children can control turning on and off. They can control the color, the color that they like, and they have that sense of control, and they can just turn it off and, and leave it as well, and, and leave the space that they're in. Um, so this is kind of the plan as it is within the Hawthorne's classroom. It's not the intention that all of these, I, I think this image can be a bit misleading. You might think it's a disco. It's, it's definitely, <laughs> it wouldn't be our intention to have all of these lights on at all times. It's about giving the teacher control, knowing that you've got setups. So you're saying, I'm doing this activity and I already know that I have a setup. So I'm just pressing setup A and it's coming to life for me and for the child, and then that the child within that has choice about what they're doing and how they can control light. And there's kind of layers within a classroom that you're not having to rely on a wider school as much anymore. Um, so that's the teacher empowerment, that flexibility of space and the children's control. Um, I'm gonna pass on to Zana now, who's gonna talk about how her school's kind of differing in that approach where it's appropriate and then about the transition spaces. Thank you. So we started the study precisely a year ago in here, the three of us, and the two schools that we have, ours is Yeoman Park Academy. So Yeoman Park Academy is an incredible school. They are in um, Mansfield, Nottinghamshire, and they are very concentrated on instilling life skills and empowering students um, to kind of build independence in their life as well. So as we are talking about existing buildings, it will not surprise you that these are the spaces that we're dealing with. So it's a mix of portable cabins, 1960s buildings, and they have been quite creative in um, doing some interesting features. For example, rainwater pipe has become a little bit of a water feature. So that works quite nicely. Very, very creative school in what they have. They have made it work wonderfully but it is split currently approximately around seven schools. And one of the schools is, um, one of the spaces that I lend actually is like a satellite. They have to walk approximately um, a couple of minutes to it. So they're lending from a, uh, spaces from adjacent school. So looking at the profile of the children itself, it is in our all through school. So we have uh, children aged three to 19. So they have a sixth form as well. Um, it's a very, very varied levels of need. You would think that I just quoted BB 104. It's not. It's just genuinely what they have in that school. 
So it is moderate learning difficulties, it is autism, it is PMLD, so we have non-ambulant learners, and it's also severe learning difficulties. And something that's really interesting and actually Claire, uh, at the end of uh, first session, um, sorry, previous session you mentioned as well, is they have based and lodge classes where they have actually split the classroom in lots of smaller spaces. So almost every single learner has their own regulatory space. So that's something that um, we hadn't seen until we come to this school, but it's quite unique. So the new building is currently being constructed with Bound Construct and hopefully in about a year and a half's time they can move in the, their new spaces. But the reality of the existing spaces that this is what we're uh, dealing with, they have a lot of um, grid ceilings, they have a lot of corridors that are relatively dark and they keep them actually dark. Um, and they have also quite harsh lighting even in those self-regulatory um, spaces as well. So, as mentioned, there is not really a controllability of lights. Some classrooms will have the DFE standard nine tiles that the option is on or off, but there's not really much option. So, uh, one of the things that um, the teachers have said is the dimming. Even just a simple thing as dimming would immediately have a huge impact on uh, the learners and create like various atmospheres within the spaces as well. So as part of the study, we looked at uh, three spaces. Um, Anna already covered uh, classrooms, so we'll just very, very quickly kind of cap the differences that we're doing in Yeoman. And we're going to look at the self-regulating classrooms and mainly transitional spaces as well. So the grouping of the space, classroom space itself is quite similar. So we have our uh, calm space, which is the orange one in the corner, which is the self-regulating corner. They actually currently don't use Corel, even though they have um, autistic learners. It's just something that hasn't worked for them at the moment, but I'll touch upon in a moment. They're very, very um, open and excited about uh, trying those. They have an informal learning corner study, study area, which is more like a teacher area. Um, that can accommodate various layouts and obviously the entrance spaces as well. So talking about Corral, they don't currently use it. However, when we presented uh, an option to them, they immediately started thinking about, okay, if we have light tables, then we could maybe have the light strips as well. And then maybe we could actually put a, a dark cloth over it and it becomes almost like another sensory room within the classroom itself as well. They're very, very creative of actually, even with from the phase one and even with the options that we are talking about to how further adapt them. So that gives them two options, either to use it for focus study or to use it as another sensory space within the space in itself. Um, another thing that they are very keen about is uh, the film. They currently already uh, from phase one have put into quite a lot of windows simple tracing paper that they find is actually helping them. Uh, the learners to avoid kind of any distraction that might be coming from outside to so somebody running up to the window, distracting them, etc. It's worked great. And as Shelley mentioned, we used a lot of light uh, films as well. But they actually found the tracing paper, as simple as that, works best. So uh, what, when we started thinking about the reading corners, um, Anna mentioned that the film, that would be kind of the main element that we are uh, putting there. But they did say that for wind finding, et cetera, they would still keep the door uh, fully glazed, so that would uh, remain as is. But one element that is gonna keep moving around the spaces, and you'll see in the visualizations as well, is our lighting box. So these are the USB chargeable boxes that you can move from space to space to space. And the school is very excited to also create another corner with our star of the show, our little pair, that you will see in a lot. So Shelley mentioned that in Yeoman Park Academy, the school was actually really, really interested in using these um, hexagon um, kind of tiles. But the one thing that I noted is that it's quite easy to peel them off the wall. So what we started um, talking about is whether it actually could be somehow routed into an MDF. So we're quite keen to explore whether that could be an element that's completely flexible, children can go, They've, it helps them focus. At the moment, it was installed in their library space, but we're thinking of moving it into this, uh, the classroom to kind of create further flexibility of space um, as it works really, really well at the moment. And the school already is using a lot of um, sensory areas within their existing classrooms before even our study started. So they already are um, quite, quite keen. So looking at the withdrawal spaces within the classrooms, um, it's quite harsh lighting at the moment. It's very, very direct, kind of pointy, and these are the rooms where they go in. They're very, very small. 
tend to be only about two square meters and they just go and self-regulate in them, teaching them independence, etc. So what we are trying to do and what we would like to do is have a softer light, maybe have some light element into it that could actually, the child could set their own preference for lighting. So giving that empowerment to the child themselves to have controllability. And the star of the show actually in the school already is transition space, something as simple as a corridor. The corridor is not just corridor, it's not just circulation space, it becomes a point of interest, is a wayfinding. And as Shelley said, they are very, very uh, key in on ordering more and more LED strips, more and more um, kind of little um, lights um, and to actually have them in the corridors. So it helps with the wayfinding. You can set certain corridors to certain lights. It becomes a point of interest. You can, um, in the phase two, what we're hoping to do is have them potentially uh, either set to certain, for example, Mondays are the green days and uh, then it moves throughout the week or actually the time of the day as well. So how that can be interchanged or whether there's actually controls to the pupil as well and how they would like to interact with the light. The school is absolutely excited and just very, very excited to see how this will work. We did explore various options, whether it actually is a little bit squiggly lines, because um, a lot of the research suggests that actually some softer lines would work well in uh, for autistic uh, learners. But actually the school said no, that we want straight lines, we want kind of the logic and um, very clean lines, That that's their preference. And uh, from the phase one, we also know that children like to uh, actually trace the light as well around. So you can see we've put it um, on top and bottom of the dado that they currently have in that circulation space where they're going to install it. And children just like going and actually just moving their hand alongside it. It's, it's something that works really well to kind of sensory space within the circulation in itself, even though it is the standard corridor size. It's nothing bigger. You definitely can't put a breakout space, anything like that there, but it works really well. And then finally, we are um, also exploring, um, as Anna mentioned, how a group room can become the sensory area. So the twinkly lights, whether we actually um, have a little bit um, of projections, a little bit of star sky and giving really that uh, control back to the child. You will see that we also have our cube. So that is a, uh, an element that can actually be used. So if it doesn't work in a classroom, in the reading corner, it could be moved elsewhere as well. So it's really, really flexible how some of these elements work. And um, a lot of our study in phase one concentrated on how we can make everything affordable in a retrofit scenario. And that was kind of the overarching element that we also want to explore in the second uh, kind of phase that I will let Shelley talk about now to summarize everything that we've spoken so far about. I'll pass that to Thank you. Thank you, great. Whew, a lot of information, huh? You guys all right still? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a bit, uh, it's not quite the graveyard shift, but we were doing well. Um, okay, so summary. <laughs> uh, no, and the graveyard shift is normally straight after lunch. Um, you guys are doing, doing well. We've just been powering you with a load of information. So in summary, we know that kids with special needs, like anybody with special needs, actually, um, they have acute visual and non-visual response. Um, and they express that response in ways that are... We, most of us regulate differently to, um, to those students. Um, we need to give them spaces where they can learn how to do that. Building standards for the workplace currently reflect our understanding of how neurodiversity, um, special needs and stress and age affect our response to light. But education is lagging behind and we find ourselves with a legal minimum which is simply not, not good enough for, well, just, just doesn't off show the potential that the next generation of lighting really has to offer in terms of flexibility, sustainability, and sheer joy. Um, we can see how these sorts of very simple retrofit solutions leaves the ceiling panels, as, I mean, leaves a grid, if just retrofit something to that, um, leaves the dado rails, but just re retrofit, find ways of um, fitting within an existing framework that's affordable, sustainable, and could be done very quickly during a school holiday or some other time, so we're not looking at decommissioning spaces. And actually give teachers a new tool to play with, allow the, the school to be part of their, of their teaching um, strategy. 
Um, and what we found so far, working so closely with Diane and Courtney, is that they are just so excited by the possibility of this new way of thinking about their building. Um, so, um, and they're ready to, to make the extra effort because we all know how busy they are. They've been staying after school. They've been, we've been having emails at it, over the weekend. If they understand why, what's in it for them, they're absolutely determined to make the most of the opportunities. So, um, the next steps. We are gearing up. We've got the designs now and starting to build up the... Um, <laughs> build up the um, budgets for this. So we're now um, in the process, we're working with the BRE to um, create a study which is bigger than our MSc student study, uh, which had, gave us lots of great feedback, but it hasn't, doesn't have the sort of academic credibility that we need in order to really pitch for a different approach to lighting and education. Um, so we've got the designs by you amazing people, and Ian McRae, who's writing the lighting guide, he's our lighting specialist design. Um, we're going to be engaging the teachers and the teaching teams, and we need to build partnerships to find the funding and support to, to go to take this, 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 this excitement to the, next, to the next stage, which would be a, a, a proper peer-reviewed um, independent study. So, um, yeah, reach out if you'd like to be involved. Uh, we're excited by that, and I hope you guys are too. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. <laughs>